Na, 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 versão, na versão ufanista aqui do, do Robert Val, ele me diz o seguinte, a Emma é da Sabesp de Londres. <risos> Hello, how are you? <risos> I said that he presented you as if you were, if you were director of the Sabesp from London. <risos> I said, yeah. <risos> Evidentemente que ela é, é, um, um, ela é gerente é, de um, um departamento da Thames Water, que é a, a empresa que gerencia, a, digamos, a bacia do Thames, no, no, e é a pessoa encarregada é, do relacionamento com, com a comunidade. Uh, Emma, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, the floor is yours for, um, I think, 20, 30, 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. okay. You speak on the mic, please. Yes, okay. Okay, and um, right. Okay, can I be heard? Can I hear? Yeah. Do you hear me? Lovely. Um, hello, good morning. Um, good morning. And thank you for inviting me to join your conference about the rivers of Sao Paulo. Um, I haven't visited Brazil before. Um, my two sons, who are football crazy, are very excited, and they've given me a shopping list of football tops. So I will be <laughs> shopping later. I'm looking forward to that. Um, it is a privilege to be here, it really is, uh, meet people who want to make a difference. And that was fascinating to hear the previous uh, presentation, to put it all in context. Louder? Yes. Sit on the chair. Thank yeah. you. I do have a quiet voice. <laughs> okay. So, I'm here today to share the experiences. Uh, it's the successes, the challenges. Uh, it's all in part of being part of the programme to clean the Thames. I'll start with setting the scene to explain the basic geography and the place of the River Thames in history. Um, here is a map of the River Thames catchment or the watershed. Uh, the Thames Basin is set in the southeast of England. It's 346 kilometres long, so I think your Tiete is four times as long as the Thames. So um, even though there is an enormous size difference, the issues affecting the rivers are always the same. Um, the Thames washes through from the west of this picture to the east. It washes through industrial areas, agricultural areas, and many, many towns before it reaches the city. And the city of London is the area shaded in grey. Negative impacts to one part of the waterway do affect the system as a whole, as I think we've just been learning as well. And this is through pollution, from road runoff, from misconnections, uh, so misconnected plumbing and sewage, as well as litter. Um, the area of the Thames that Thames 21 focuses on is within this central London area. Uh, the Thames runs through the centre of here, <coughs> and you can see uh, the city is where there's a large meander. The city is in that part of um, the centre of London. This area, it sh shown here, supports 8.7 million people. So again, it's a complete contrast to the number of people you have um, in your area. But again, all of these people do have a connection with the Thames. Many of the people there do not realise the impact their lives have and also the demand that their lives and the way they live have on the river. This is as we um, water has to be abstracted for domestic use and commercial use. And of course, the agriculture has a huge impact as well. The Thames is very interesting as it is a tidal river. Um, on the far side, so in the, in the east, is the estuary, and that leads out to the North Sea. Um, but every day, the tide has seven metre change from high to low tide. So that in itself brings massive issues and massive problems, because on each tide, the pollution and the litter comes and goes. We've been talking recently to the Port of London Authority who managed the river. And we're trying to model how much the litter stays within the tidal section, within the main part of the city, and how much actually does go out to sea. So we're trying to discover more at the moment. OK. And a little bit of history, in case um, some of you are not aware. London's, London was inhabited in the year AD 50. And the Thames has enabled its growth and expansion. So this is a photograph of um, London in development. And without the river running through the middle, for, um, growth and development wouldn't have come to the city. 
It is a working river, but being so, it's brought great pollution. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't realised that the health of the river is actually important to the prosperity and the development of the city. Um, it's operated as an international port for many, many years, many, many centuries, excuse me. Um, and it connects, it is an international port which connects out to the sea and out to the ocean. But the river is also a waste disposal system. The river's been used as a sewer until 1866. Um, it, 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 things changed in 1866 because of two events that preceded it. Uh, the second one here, in 1858, the Great Stink, as it is known, is very well documented, as our Houses of Parliament are based on the river where the ministers and the government meet. The river smelt so horrendous, so vile in 1858 that Parliament and the government were not able to meet. So it was this important factor that led to um, Joseph Bazalgette, um, a, a revolutionary engineer, designing a scheme that divided raw sewage away into tunnels, as you can see from the lower picture there. And that's a picture of him with his wonderful uh, moustache of the time, fashions of the times. Let's hope that doesn't come back. And this is a picture of the sewage um, system being constructed in the 1860s. Um, it's still operational today, which is incredible. Um, this system was built for two million people, as there were only two million people living in London at the time. Now London has a population of nearly nine million. So to solve this water and sewage um, issue, the, the company called Thames Water, which is I think the equivalent of the sanitation and water company that you have here. They are investing 3.6 million pounds, sorry, billion pounds to tackle the 39 million tonnes of storm sewage that do overflow into our tidal Thames um, in an average year. This is still an issue that we have. So we are, Thames Water are investing in this system and there's a company called Tideway who are constructing an, an interception tunnel. So thank you for the the wonderful description of inter interception tunnels. <laughs> I have some statistics here. Um, so our tunnel, which will be underneath the Thames, will be 7.2 metres diameter, an interception and transfer tunnel, but this will be running 65 metres below the river itself. It will intercept and collect sewage from 34 of the most polluting combined sewage overflows. And it'll take them from these discharge points down to new sewage systems to be treated. So even with Bazalgette's innovative system back um, in the 1800s, by the, 19, by the year 1957, the Thames was declared biologically dead, which is shocking to think that even with those tunnels taking the sewage away, uh, but now there's the contribution of other pollutants that add to the issue with industrialization and agricultural runoffs. Yet by 1990, it was I'm pleased to say that the chemical quality of the rivers within the Thames catchment was classed as very good or good by the Environment Agency, which is the government agency for our rivers. And it's great to be able to report that the estuary supports viable shell fisheries and is a nursery ground for fishing as well, with many species of fish now being found. The Environment Agency is the public body and the authority responsible for the protection and the enhancement of the environment, and it's a key partner who we work with at Thames 21. They state that they will continue to bring in tighter regulation of polluting industries and work with farmers, businesses and water companies to continue to reduce pollution and improve water quality. All of this is helping to make the Thames a living river once again. So I've given you some history and background about the Thames and the history of London and where we are now, but um, who's Thames 21? I work for an NGO called Thames 21 we were established to reduce initially just the litter and the sewage from the Thames and the tributaries. Um, in the UK, nobody is responsible for removing the litter from rivers. You can get fined if you do litter, but nobody is responsible for making any movements to remove anything. So the first activity Thames 21 was involved in was an informal river clean back in 1994. This came about as people were coming together because they were frustrated and they could see the rubbish and they knew nobody was responsible. So an informal group of people got together and volunteered and this enthusiasm has grown and grown. It's absolutely incredible. We work with thousands of volunteers over the years. Um, initially we were called Thames Clean 
But um, this evolved, and in 19, sorry, 2004, we became a charity. So we were formalised as a non-government organisation. We now have 28 members of paid staff. We have one chief executive, four senior managers, and about 23 project staff who work across the region, now into the estuary as well. <coughs> We're overseen by a board of trustees. As a non-government organisation, we have a board of trustees to oversee us, and they are, they are representative of our funders and our stakeholders as well. We've also evolved from just picking up litter. We have four key areas of work that we focus on. The first one is river improvements, and this includes installing sustainable urban drainage systems and monitoring the water quality as well. So citizen scientists are given kits, basic equipment to monitor the chemistry of the rivers. Um, the, another fun thing that we do is that we actually wade along the river, and we call this an outfall safari. So we put on waders, and we go along, and we look and monitor where the outfalls are polluting into the river, and then this gets reported back to the Thames Water Authority who endeavour to deal with the, um, the pollution and the people who are causing that pollution. Um, uh, the second team is volunteering and community engagement. Now, this is my team and includes, this is about maintaining numbers and improving the volunteer experience uh, within the organisation. The third team is education and training. And within our education team, we run an education centre where thousands of children visit every year and get taught about the water cycle and rivers and everything that's related in the but related to their national curriculum as well. <laughs> the fourth team is campaigning and advocacy, which is absolutely key to developing and involving more people. I'll talk more about campaigns later. When Thames 21 began, the issues were quite different to what we see now. There was a lot of heavy metal waste. This is the shopping trolley. If you can see that on the picture there. Um, and a lot of the rubbish that we found was shopping trolleys, traffic cones, and heavy industrial waste. This has now moved on, and this is more likely the picture that we see. And as I said, on the tidal river, this, as much as we remove this rubbish, it then washes up again on the next tide. So it's, it is a constant battle still. But the number that it, it is improving, this is, um, this is uh, taken a few years ago. Um, this is one of the issues that we talk about there, because even though volunteers go out and the tide goes out, the river beaches, as we call them, that's an access onto the river beach at low tide, the litter comes back again. But there were some beaches that no matter how much you clean them up, the, temp the, the rubbish would return. And in recent years, we've noticed a distinct change in the rubbish that we pick up as well. It's clear that litter is entering the river quicker than we can actually remove it. We need to stop it getting there in the first place, but we didn't have the hard data or any evidence to take this forward. So this wasn't the only problem, though. As I think is obvious, the health of the tidal Thames is widely misunderstood. But many people see it as a brown river, and they think immediately that it's actually a polluted, very polluted river, but it's actually naturally brown, and it was brown way back in AD 50 when the Romans first invaded London and set up Londinium. Um, so there's a lot of lack of awareness around this um, because there's also reports on how clean the Thames is and in 2010 the Thames won the International Thies River Prize which was a surprise in truth the, sorry, in, the, the truth is actually somewhere in between those two reports really um, but the lack of awareness is a problem because the river faces threats in the 21st century and it needs a campaign to, su to, su to move this forward Thames River Watch, this is our solution to the problems. It's a citizen science programme and it engages people directly in the collection of information and is also collecting data which we can use to talk about the health of the Thames. This data helps enable greater understanding of the issues the river faces and what needs to be done to improve its health. All volunteers are <coughs> trained by Thames 21 in how to monitor so that the same data is collected across numerous sites up and down the Thames. And this data is, is stored on a digital map. So we volunteers can see the data they're collecting, see the changes that are making, and also we hope that this data will be made <coughs> publicly available as well. Uh, this citizens of science program involves individuals, community groups, as well as local businesses who invest in their local stretches as well. Now the Thames River Watch, to summarize this, this is about two areas of focus. One is that we want to improve our understanding, and this is through the litter monitoring data that we're collecting. 
but also we want to improve Londoners' understanding. So as well as having the data, we are running perception surveys through our ambassadors who ask passers-by on the Thames what they think the health of the river is like. And so we can use those two data sets to, to move forward. Um, every year we have about 10,000 volunteers uh, across all the different teams and we have a lot of corporates who come out as well. It is a lot of people, yes. <laughs> um, but And this is my next point, actually, in fact. We were always curious from the very beginning in 1994, would people help? Why would anyone want to come out and join in? But day after, week after week, year after year, we have thousands of volunteers helping us. From the very beginning, um, it was a concern, but actually the river, there's something about the river. There's something about putting boots on. You can see the people in this photograph are wearing what we call Wellington boots. So boots, rubber boots, so we can get down to the beach and get in the mud. Boots on the ground. Boots on the exactly, <laughs> exactly, very nice. <laughs> um, so year after year, thousands of volunteers are helping us to remove the litter. It's something that we can't do alone. And here you can see one of the methods that we use. This is a yellow cage that the Port of London Authority um, put on the bottom of the tide, the bottom of the beach at, at low tide, and volunteers come along, fill it up, and then when the next tide comes along, the Port of London Authority take away this rubbish that's filled up in the cage, and they sort it and they recycle as much as they can. So it's not all just going to landfill as well, which is important with the changing nature of all the plastic that we're removing. At least we're confident that that's also getting recycled, which is good news. Um, but how do we find all these volunteers? This is really important. As I said, we're so reliant on this volunteer uh, input to make a difference. Um, we have a calendar of events on our website, which we keep up to date. We post blogs as well, so people, so staff members write about issues that are concerning them, so to encourage other people. We use e-news a lot as well, so my communications colleague writes newsletters, not too lengthy, just pinpointing some exciting things that are happening, and that gets sent out by email to our interested volunteers. Uh, we also find in London that um, Londoners are a keen user of social media, and there's lots of Facebook posts, Instagram, Twitter. We use all these social media platforms, and we have approximately 12,000 followers at the moment across all those platforms. Uh, we also use local TV, local radio, and newspapers. Um, all these media like to uh, promote an event beforehand, but also follow up with the story afterwards. We've had a lot of coverage on local BBC News and local London News as well recently, which is fantastic to reach such a big audience um, across, across the region. We also create innovative events and campaigns. So it's not just about coming out and picking it up. We try to link and give things names. We've had all sorts of names like the Unflushables, which is about what you shouldn't put down the toilet, as well as the Three Rivers Cleanup, which is a, um, a cleanup focused on one of our tributaries. And this has been focused year after year on clearing up an invasive plant, which is invading the river. And it's fantastic that after many years of work, this plant has been removed from this particular tributary on the river. And we've also had a program called Only Rain in Rivers, which is about putting drain markers next to drains so people know not what to pour down drains so as that flows directly to the river. <coughs> Excuse me. We also um, link with national and international campaigns. You might have heard of things like World Waters Day, which was in March, and World Rivers Day, which is in September. Again, these can have such great traction on social media and encouraging pe more people to become aware of the health of the Thames. The volunteer experience is also really important to us. Um, it's not just about volunteers coming out. This is, we really want to retain our volunteers and make sure our volunteers feel valued and enjoy what they do. But to do this, um, because it can be a hard graft, it can be, as, as the gentleman there, and there in the yellow top, it can be hard work, heavy work, if there's heavy work to, heavy equipment to remove. And walking in the mud and up and down the, the shore can be tiring. But um, it's gratifying, it's, it's so visually, effect, so the effect is so obvious at the end after a project when you can actually see the difference. Thames 21 provides equipment as well. This is encouraging. This is something else that we can encourage volunteers to come out with. If they know that they don't have to bring their own Wellington boots, their gloves, all the, all the bags, we provide everything that is needed 
to help it run smoothly. We also provide hand washing facilities, so some water, some soap, some antibacterial gel, so that we know volunteers are clean and health and, <coughs> health and safety is a priority as well. We do have committed volunteers. Um, I like the way that some of these quotes that we have here, um, I might let Paula just translate them so you can see if that's needed. What I like is the way people start taking pride in the Thames once they get involved. We'll keep it at it until we can find a way of stopping inconsiderate people dumping rubbish in the first place. I like that one. Volunteering shows the community that they can organise themselves to do something about local problems, all those about the issues, and volunteers know that they can do it, coming together as a team. But actually what helps as well within these teams is actually having someone to lead them. That is really important, we find, that our volunteers need leadership. Thames 21 has um, found that Volunteers want someone else to take the responsibility, someone else to do all the logistics. And it's important to find those key people that can do that. Um, all in all, the experience is enjoyable and satisfying, as shown by those statements. But in addition to this, an effective solution was installed by the Port of London Authority. If you can see at the front of this picture, there's a sign saying, helping to keep the Thames clean. That is actually a um, a, a floating device that collects the rubbish as it floats through on the tide. And you can see one here with the rubbish inside it. There's about 12 of these up and down the tidal section of the Thames, and these are managed and maintained by the Port of London Authority. They are strategically placed so they catch the litter on the, on the flow of the river as it goes around the meanders. They're very clever, and they do pick up all sorts, but they're very effective. So that's just another method that is working on the Thames. Here's some photos that show the change over time. The top photo, uh, which is with the Millennium Dome in the background, all those white dots along the beach there, that's all plastic bags, all single-use plastic bags. And that was taken in about 2001. Then in the year two, 2016, we've cleared the beach. This has taken thousands and thousands of hours and volunteers and sack loads of bags to take them away as well. And it's a great photo of the volunteers in action. But in addition to the volunteer work here, what we have found is that a couple of years ago, the government brought in a, leg, um, um, a 5p charge for plastic bags. So we also found that in, in conjunction that both these things have had an effect and we don't get the litter from plastic bags that we did a few years ago. So even having that levy on plastic bags has made a vast difference. One thing that we find is very effective is having sustainable group activities. Again, this is a map of the larger London area of the Thames Basin, and the dots show where we have local groups. So local groups of volunteers have come together, and they set themselves up to look after their local waterway. Thames 21 trains these volunteers in a course that we simply call Leading a Waterway Cleanup. It's a course that helps organize the volunteers so they know what needs to be prepared, what they need to get together. And what we do find is that local authorities and partners like this because once a group of people have done our training, they are then covered by our insurance. So landowners, the authorities, they're happy for us to have more and more groups of people because they're looking after their local waterways and they're covered by our health and safety and our insurance. Um, so it's, it's a win-win situation. Uh, we also run it as a free training course and it's accredited so every participant gets a certificate as well which is fantastic in developing volunteers motivation and supporting their development as well so these community hubs uh, so the community hubs around the re region are one area but we're also developing three or four very specific hubs just on the Thames itself um, these will have specific areas where they can keep their equipment again and there'll be a group of people who can focus just on their local section of the Thames. And I mentioned earlier about the monitoring. This is where they will focus. And volunteers are so dedicated. They return every two weeks when the tides are right. And they, pick, they collect data that we are collecting and to pick up that picture about how the health of the Thames is improving and how the litter is changing as well. Partnerships are vital to the development and the, the way we work at Thames 21. Uh, we have various um, levels of partnerships. 
we work very closely on a political level with government agencies such as the Environment Agency, the Port of London Authority as they manage um, the, the tidal sections of the river right out to the estuary. Thames Water is the water and sanitation company. And we work very closely with them. They're very supportive of the work of our small organisation as well. Tideway are building the tunnel underneath the Thames and they fund us for a lot of our work on the citizen science projects. On a um, non-governmental level, we work with wildlife trusts, rivers trusts, the zoo, which is called ZSL, and um, other similar types of organisations who have an environmental focus as well. Some key funders and stakeholders are also within those um, logos up there as well. And this is just a snapshot that we have so many partners and funders to run our organisation. One key one here is the Thames Litter Forum. In recent years, plastic and the rivers have really captured people's imagination. Londoners are really concerned. And so bit by bit, more and more people were doing more and more activity on the Thames, whether it was academic or cleaning up or citizen science. The Thames Litter Forum is a group of people is, is, is bringing together all those groups of people so we have set forums we come together so we know that we're not replicating work that is being done elsewhere and we're communicating really well within that forum another area that's um, of vital importance is we work a lot with academic scientists this really gives real substance to the work that we're developing and universities really enjoy connecting with their river and a lot of phds and master's students do work with us as well. Thames 21 is a really keen supporter of campaigns. Uh, I've mentioned a few already. Uh, this, what we want to see is people change their own behaviour. Um, one we run called London Rivers Week. It happens later in May. And this is about people enjoying the river. So it's not just about coming up and cleaning up the river. This is about learning more about rivers and discovering them. Um, the In the Drink campaign, uh, we've developed this through the single-use plastic cups that we find. We were finding hundreds and hundreds of these on the Thames at low tide. And these were obviously coming from bar bars and pubs and party boats that are on the tidal Thames. So we used that data to fundraise for some money. And with that money, we developed this program called In the Drink, which is quite a kind of catchy jargon, but it works. And we talked to 160 pubs in the area to find out what they currently do and what would help them make a change if they hadn't already made a change to glass <coughs> or cups that they can put in the dishwasher and glasses that can be used again and again and again. The website actually looks at the barriers that are stopping people and bar managers changing. And so this website actually offers also suggestions as how much would they would have to invest financially to make a change. So it was using the evidence and looking at barriers to helping people make a change. The One Less campaign is as simple as that. It's actually about campaigning to encourage people to use one less plastic bottle and to always carry a refillable bottle with them in London. So that's having some traction as well. That's doing really well. We often get asked how much wildlife is there in the Thames. It looks brown, it looks dirty, it looks muddy, it looks grubby. But... Um, what we're finding is that we have 125 species of fish, so that in itself is, you know, the, the river is alive, it's healthy, it's returning, and um, this is a common seal joining a paddle border. So in the west of London, where the river is slower, we have a lot of stand-up paddle borders and canoeing, and this seal keeps on being seen, which in itself must mean there's fish to eat. So he's a lovely fella that keeps on joining the stand-up paddle borders, and he's on social media as well. <laughs> but just to summarise our evolution, we were formed in 1994, and it was interesting, the previous speaker mentioned 1994 as a moment of change as well, and we were formed out of that, uh, the following up from the... Rio Earth Summit as well, and I think these all kind of combined back in the early 1990s. And we formed as a charity, and we've slowly evolved, involving more and more people, and developing our programs so that we look at more than just the litter. So it's about the whole picture and a holistic approach to how the river can be made healthier and involving people in that. But actually what I think is important to also summarise is actually, I do talk about volunteers a lot, and I, I'm, I'm all for volunteering. I've been a volunteer for many years myself, previous to Thames 21. 
But I think what it's important to remember is that volunteers aren't just the workforce. They're not just the labor. They really can be that moment of passing on a message, that they can be the people that help to make the change in other people. And volunteers need to be appreciated. We try and go down the pub and arrange annual uh, by man or regular events to go down and celebrate outside of the river so we can actually appreciate each other and know what's going on as well. It's also documented how much um, working outside, and particularly in a group, can really have a positive health, uh, impact on people's health and well-being as well, which is so important in this fast, crazy world that we live in. So it's an immeasurable and kind of a sense of achievement that can be added to this as well. Um, to conclude, I love this statement. I've, I have one colleague who's constantly looking up quotations about rivers, and he puts them up. And this is one that really appealed to me when I was trying to find something appropriate for today. And it's, a river is more than an amenity, it is a treasure. This is um, written by an American physician back in the 1800s, uh, Oliver Holmes. And I just think, um, take a moment to kind of realise that. And I have translated it into Portuguese, um, which I believe is correct and not, nothing, <laughs> nothing rude in there. <laughs> okay. It's just a reminder that the rivers are the arteries to our cities and it's um, vital to have them. So just on concluding that, I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And it's great to be here. Thank you. Emma, uh, thank you so much for first for making the time to come here. And thank you for the very interesting and comprehensive <laughs> presentation. If you allow me to sort of um, shed light on some takeaways that I think are essential to us is that we, of course, we need a long-term uh, commitment in terms of investment to clean a river and to keep it clean. Uh, we need the technical cap capabilities, and we do have the, the technical capability. But we clearly, we do need more than that. We, we need uh, <laughs> social mobilization. We need social engagement. And this is not something that happens spontaneously, right? You need a, a, a deliberate strategy and well-organized effort uh, to involve people. And once you put this in traction, uh, in motion, you can have uh, the sort of things that you've showed us here. And I, I think we badly need to learn from you. So uh, this is your first time here. I hope it's not the last. <laughs> and I think as uh, people from Sao Paulo, uh, I would ask you to, uh, to come um, in the future, in the, in, the, in, the, in the near future, so that we can learn from this experience uh, it will be very helpful for, for Sao Paulo and, 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 and for the state and for the city. So thank you so much. We're going to break for 20 minutes, and then we get back to the room. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.